Um, you know, the Holy Spirit acts in many strange and mysterious ways, and um, I'm not going to say that it's uh, impacting our technical uh, <laughs> audio-visual stuff, but we can all say prayers that uh, things work as they should, and if not, grace will abound and the word still will be proclaimed. Um, we are grateful for those who make efforts to get our glitchy system unglitched. So uh, you may see some images, you may see some words. <laughs> I may have to start doing mime. I don't know what it's going to take, but uh, we, will, we will preach nonetheless. <clears throat> Christian author C.S. Lewis wrote the book, Mere Christianity. Lewis introduces readers to beliefs that are common to all Christians, what he calls mere Christianity. He also talks about how Christians are to relate to one another and uses the analogy of a long hallway with many rooms branching off from it. He shares an extended quote that has bearing on today's message. Lewis writes, I hope no reader will suppose that mere Christianity is here put forward as an alternative to the creeds of the existing communions, as if a person could adopt it in preference to Congregationalism or Greek Orthodoxy or anything else. It is more like a hall out of which doors open into several rooms. If I can bring anyone into that hall, I shall have done what I attempted. But it is in the rooms, not in the hall, that there are fires and chairs and meals. The hall is a place to wait in, a place from which to try the various doors, not a place to live in. For that purpose, the worst of the rooms whichever that may be, is, I think, preferable. It is true that some people may find they have to wait in the hall for a considerable time, while others feel certain almost at once which door they must knock at. I do not know why there is this difference, but I am sure God keeps no one waiting unless he sees that it is good for them to wait. When you do get into your room, you will find that the long wait has done you some kind of good, which you would not have had otherwise. But you must regard it as waiting, not as camping. You must keep on praying for light, and of course, even in the hall, you must begin trying to obey the rules which are common to the whole house. And above all, you must be asking which door is the true one not which pleases you best by its paint and paneling. In plain language, the question should never be, do I like that kind of service? But are these doctrines true? Is holiness here? Does my conscience move me toward this? Is my reluctance to knock on this door due to my pride or my mere taste or my personal dislike of this particular doorkeeper? When you have reached your own room, be kind to those who have chosen different doors and to those who are still in the hall. If they are wrong, they need your prayers all the more. And if they are your enemies, then you are under orders to pray for them. That is one of the rules common to the whole house. A house with a hallway and many doors has something in common with our reading. Let's take a look. Paul addresses the Roman church in hopes of prying open some closed doors. This apostle to the Gentiles speaks not only to Gentile Christians, but also Jewish Christians in hopes of opening some shut doors. Paul takes a stepped approach to unlock some doors. In today's passage, he moves us from the porch, past the threshold, and into the house. The porch level is seen in verse 1. 
we who are strong ought to put up with the failings of the weak. The strong are the liberal Gentile Christians that don't follow Jewish law, while the weak are the conservative Jewish Christians that do. Paul's advising the strong Gentile Christians to put up with the failings of the weak Jewish Christians within their church. For example, at the church potluck, not to roll their eyes when asked if the baked beans have pork in them, but to put up with it. Not to let out an exasperated sigh when fellow believers pass on the shrimp cocktail, but to put up with it. Not to quarrel about the rack of ribs sacrificed to idols, but to put up with it. Not to engage in arguments at the table about whether the Sabbath or Sunday is the proper day of worship, but to put up with it. Not to get into disputes at the men's fellowship group about the merits of circumcision, but to put up with it. In order for the church to have some modicum of community and some degree of civility, the strong sometimes must put up with it. Paul knows that something more than civility is required for true community. The Roman church cannot simply remain on the porch, but needs to move a step higher to the threshold. More than mere tolerance, on the threshold people are accepted, respected, and appreciated. Paul reminds members of this congregation that they are not to please themselves, but rather their neighbor for the good purpose of building up their neighbor. On the porch, members put up with one another, but on the threshold, they build up one another. How does that building up occur? Verses 4 and 5 speak of the encouragement of the scriptures and the God of encouragement. Paul reminds the Roman church that along with the scriptures being a source of encouragement and God being a source of encouragement, that they themselves are to be a source of encouragement. That encouragement comes about because there's a mutual acceptance, respect, and appreciation. If a church is filled with people where there's reciprocal acceptance, respect, and appreciation, it creates a feedback loop where there's an overflow of encouragement. That overflow of encouragement leads them to live in harmony with one another so that together they may with one voice glorify God. As satisfied as many churches would be with this level of community, thresholds are not where people dwell. Paul says, there's a doorway beyond the threshold leading into the house itself. More than the putting up of the, of the porch or the building up of the threshold, something even greater awaits. He writes, welcome one another just as Christ has welcomed you. How has Christ welcomed them? The next verse says, Christ became a servant. With one word, servant, Paul evokes a whole host of associations that overturn common expectations. Elsewhere, Paul says that Jesus took the form of a slave, humbled himself, and was born in human likeness. Jesus said he came not to be served, but to serve, and washed his disciples' feet as a servant would. 
rather than a lord of the manor who in pomp and splendor awaits on his throne to receive us groveling, instead he sees us with compassion, throws off all decorum, and comes running to welcome prodigals with embraces and kisses. It's a welcome that includes compassionate understanding, unwavering support, and extravagant celebration with robes, rings, sandals, fatted calves, music, and dancing. Although Jesus is a servant, he won't welcome us as hired servants, but rather beloved children. He doesn't welcome us from his throne room, but is just inside the door kneeling to welcome us with basin and towel. Verse 13 rounds out the extent of that welcome just inside the door. The Holy Spirit will fill us with all joy and peace and will abound in hope. The kind of welcome Christ has extended to us and we are to extend to others is humble, serving, embracing, and loving. Christ has welcomed us with compassionate understanding, unwavering support, and extravagant celebration, and we are to welcome others in just the same way. In welcoming others as Christ has welcomed us, we'll be filled with all joy, peace, and hope to extend the welcome we ourselves have received from Christ is the truest embodiment of community. Our founders in the Stone Campbell movement knew that establishing churches wasn't easy. Even more difficult in some ways was maintaining them, keeping the doors open. Squabbles weren't limited to first century Roman congregations, after all. 19th century American congregations had their share of squabbles too. One in particular threatened to divide churches as it did the nation during the Civil War, the issue of slavery. Christians north and south of the Mason-Dixon line drew completely opposite conclusions to this issue. Each side quoted scripture to bolster their respective positions. Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterians, each split over this issue prior to the outbreak of the Civil War. Doors were slammed shut, and some still remain closed today. Alexander Campbell, leader of a movement created to unite the church, was squarely against slavery. To avoid his own movement's division, he distinguished between matters of faith and matters of opinion. Matters of faith required unanimity, while on matters of opinion, one could differ. Slavery was not a matter of faith but rather opinion. Now we may quibble over this distinction today, but Campbell was able to maintain the unity of his movement when others failed. He realized, as did Paul, there would be issues that would cause strong and weak to slam doors on each other's faces. In an effort to avoid such dissensions and divisions, our founders took to heart a phrase from Rupertus Meldinius. Meldinius was a 17th century Lutheran theologian who wrote, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, in all things, charity. On matters of faith, the essentials, there must be unity. On matters of opinion, 
or non-essentials, there should be liberty. In all matters, however, whether of faith or opinion, there must be love. This phrase summarizes our character and our ethos at its best. United in essentials, differing on non-essentials, yet always loving. Campbell, as Paul had before him, wanted church members to do more than put up with one another, more than build up one another, but to truly welcome in one another as Christ has welcomed us. Our founders knew that establishing and maintaining churches wasn't easy. Weak and strong would squabble over matters of faith and opinion. Yet Meldinius's phrase would help keep doors open regardless. Slammed doors in faces. Roman noses got slammed over dietary issues. Frontier noses in America got slammed over slavery issues. And noses today in postmodern America get slammed over sexuality issues. Congregants get crabby. Denominations get testy. As strong and weak, liberal and conservatives slam doors and go their separate ways. No longer welcoming one another as Christ has. No longer building up one another. And no longer putting up with one another. Christians doing their best to throw each other out the door, past the porch, and onto the curb. We've forgotten the welcome we receive from Christ. Is it any wonder that non-believers watching this divisive debacle have no interest in darkening the door of a church? We've forgotten the second house rule of praying for those whom we believe to be wrong and praying for our enemies. We've forgotten that at one time we were wrong. We've forgotten that at one time we were enemies of Christ on the wrong side of the door. We've forgotten all the times God put up with our weaknesses. We've forgotten all the time some weak member held us up in prayer, and we didn't know a thing about it, but God did. Yet there's a chance, brothers and sisters, that if we recollect those things that we'd forgotten, that we just might recollect ourselves as a church. We'll recall all those encouragements that came our way by Scripture. We'll recall all those encouragements that came our way by God. We'll recall all those encouragements that even came our way from the most unlikely folks. We'll recall how pleasing it is to be built up and to build up one another. We'll recall what it's like to live in harmony with one another. We'll recall what it's like to share unity, have liberty, and in all things, charity. We'll recall what it's like to glorify God with one voice. We'll recall what it's like to be accepted, respected, and appreciated. Then we'll remember that Christ came as a servant. Then we'll remember how he welcomed us. We'll remember his compassionate understanding. We'll remember his unwavering support. We'll remember his extravagant celebration in welcoming us inside a door we thought we'd never see. Then we'll rejoice that the Holy Spirit is filling us with all joy. Then we'll rejoice that the Holy Spirit is filling us with all peace. Then we'll rejoice that the Holy Spirit is filling us with all hope. Remembering all those things will become the doorways through which others encounter Christ. No longer waiting for them to come to us. We'll go to them, welcoming them as Christ has welcomed us will become the many doors through which others will enter the one church. Christ is waiting for them 
to step through your life into his arms. Be an open door for him and for them. In Jesus' name, amen.